Hello, everyone. I'm Mirbet al Asnaj. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and I'm here with PCR Online with the TCT uh, 2025 late breaking clinical trials. With us today is Dr. Michael Mack. He is a cardiac surgeon at Baylor Scott and White Hospital in Texas, United States. He's also the co principal investigator of the Partner 3 Low Risk Trial. Dr. Mack, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So the Partner 3 Low Risk Trial was um, the one year results were presented in 2019 and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. There was a lot of enthusiasm after that because the results were um, very promising in terms of hard endpoints at one year where TAVR performed better than surgical aortic valve replacement in that category of patients. Looking at some of the softer endpoints, quality of life and so on, were also um, far better in the transcatheter aortic valve arm. Now, that was only one year. Subsequently, we saw that the... Um, five-year results published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and we started to see that uh, there was similarity between the two groups, i.e. surgical and transcatheter. Um, there wasn't that gap in terms of quality of life or the hard endpoints. So now we are going to hear from you about the seven-year results, and we're keen to see what happens with these results. Are they going to continue to, um, you know, Merge? Are we going to see a difference? We're going to start diverging again. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit more about the seven-year results presented at TCT? Sure. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the the trial was a, a thousand patients that were low risk, um, randomized half to tavern, half to surgery, and at one year, uh, to our surprise at the time, tavern was superior to surgery. Um, it was statistically superior, but the um, most uh, of the benefit was all in rehospitalization. Numerically stroke and numerically uh, uh, death um, uh, favored TAVR over surgery, uh, but the real difference was due to rehospitalization. But we saw an attenuation of the difference by five years uh, uh, so that there was some catch up. Uh, um, in the surgical arm, uh, and the results were not inferior at five years. So we're seeing the same thing at seven years. There's further attenuation of the differences. Um, there is uh, no advantage uh, um, in terms of mortality uh, to TAVR anymore. As a matter of fact, numerically, uh, um, there are more deaths in TAVR than surgery. Uh, but not statistically different. Uh, stroke is virtually the same. And even rehospitalization is very close to one another right now. Uh, so that um, there are two primary endpoints. One is a, 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 a non-hierarchical composite of death stroke uh, and um, uh, rehospitalization. And, and the hazard ratio is 0 0.87. Uh, so al almost virtually the same results at seven years. And then the second is a, a hierarchical, um, say, same in five, as five years, a hierarchical uh, comparison of death, disabling stroke, non-disabling stroke, and hospitalization. And the win ratio is 1.04, virtually the same as one another. So the bottom line is that... Um, uh, the benefits of TABR are in the first year, uh, but everything is trending towards surgery from years one through seven, so that by seven years, uh, it, it's virtually uh, the, the same results in, in both treatments. In five years, we did see a clinically significant, um, although albeit rare, um, higher number of valve thrombosis in the TABR arm compared with the surgical arm. Now, what are the implications for that in terms of stroke, valve durability, and so on, in your opinion? So, um, so t two things. Uh, first of all, there was between five and seven years, there was only one valve thrombosis in each arm. Uh, so it was an early event uh, and is not a, a late uh, event. 
Uh, and secondly, uh, patients that did have valve thrombosis uh, early on to this point show uh, no issues with valve durability at this point. You know, um, what we saw early on is a lot of the early clinical valve thrombosis resolved. Um, uh, and uh, uh, some of it, uh, you know, on anticoagulation, but those that had clinically significant uh, uh, valve thrombosis early on uh, have not had issues with valve durability. Now, in terms of echocardiographic findings, we also see from the five-year results that um, there was slight increase in the gradient with the TAVR. Um, but it didn't really translate into anything meaningful, certainly not in terms of clinical endpoints or durability. So what is our take home here? So what is your practice in terms of echocardiographic follow-up of patients who will be getting TAVR and are considered low risk? So the echocardiographic results um, at at seven years are, are, are virtually the same in both arms. Uh, there's an you know, a non-significant difference in terms of mean gradient and aortic valve area. And, um, you know, what I would say is they're excellent in both. And this is the first time that we've had systematic core lab follow-up uh, in surgical valves. So uh, even though we've got 50-year history of surgical valves, we never had this method of, of follow-up before. But the other interesting finding from the ECHO standpoint uh, is that um, patients that had mild paravalvular leak uh, at 30 days uh, afterwards uh, in the TAVR arm had no difference in seven-year survival compared to patients that didn't have paravalvular leak. Uh, and that the incidence of bioprosthetic valve failure was low um, in both arms in terms of durability uh, and aortic valve reintervention was about the same in both arms, about 6% in each uh, out to seven years. So based on the seven-year results, how do you think this should impact guidelines and practice, again, primarily in low-risk patients? Well, you, you know, the, you know, both are a, a class one indication, you, you know, right now. Um, in patients, uh, I guess, over 65 and over 70 in the, um, uh, in the two guidelines, the Americans and the European guidelines. Um, I understand there's some controversy about 70 in the, Euro in the European guidelines. Um, the U.S. guidelines, I understand, are being uh, updated uh, uh, currently. Um, and you know the if you look at um if you look at the evidence to influence guidelines uh you know there's only um uh you know um less than um uh, you know less than um 6% of patients uh in, in this study were under 65 years old uh and under 12 and only 12% were under 70 years old so you can argue that uh, although the randomized trial included patients, um, uh, a few patients under 65 and some patients under 70, the evidence base isn't strong there. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go out on a limb and speculate what guidelines, you know, may, may show. But um, and we also have, you know, we also have the, the notion to trial data out to 10 years, although there's very few patients. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll have the, uh, Evolute trial results coming out in another year or so, presumably at uh, seven years. You know, I will say that we've got, uh, uh, we've got mortality results on, uh, 95% of patients on this trial. We've got, you know, primary endpoint results on 90% and we're able to determine survival on 95%. So we do have very complete results on a large number of patients. Yeah, that certainly is impressive. Um, and I think, again, to circle back to what you said earlier, we do have a lot more surgical follow-up in our patients, um, although the number of patients who are lost to follow-up, as I understand it from 
surgical arm were slightly more than those in the TAVR arm, uh, but we still managed to achieve a good uh, percentage yeah, of so, Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> you know, that's typical uh, of the, the control arm of uh, any trial in that, um, you know, patients that don't get the treatment arm, there's difficult, you know, having them come back to follow up for treatment. So we saw a disproportionate loss to follow up at, at five years and at seven years, which can, of course, affect the results. But <clears throat> what the FDA uh, had mandated uh, um, was that we do what's called a vital status sweep. So uh, we're able to use publicly available data uh, to determine um, uh, survival. And we were able to get equal follow-up in both arms for mortality uh, uh, by doing that. So we have 94 and 95% follow-up uh, for mortality in both arms. Uh, we don't have um, a quite as high uh, a follow-up with 90% with more TABR than surgery at um, uh, for the other endpoints. So we can't determine uh, we can't determine stroke. We can't determine aortic valve reintervention. Uh, f uh, we can't determine cause of death uh, uh, in in those additional patients that we found. Um, but we do have that survival data, which is uh, critical. So, you know, we've been talking in the last couple of years about lifetime management when it comes to aortic stenosis. And for these patients, the low-risk patients, the mean age was about 73 uh, in the partner trial. What are your thoughts now that we know that up to seven years, the outcomes, there's no difference, the durability, even in patients who have had, you know, either valve thrombosis, paravalvular leaks, and so on, it really did not impact uh, either outcomes or durability. So what what is the, uh, you know, impact of this trial on our thoughts with regards to lifetime management? Well, I, I mean, the, the first thing that you're going to hear is, boy, these lines continue to converge and, and what's going to happen by 10 years. So there, of course, will be all that speculation. Uh, but this is the first time we're seeing a patient population in which the patients uh, are outliving their valves. So the competing risk of death is not nearly as great as it's been in uh, previous trials. So um, so that's the first part of it. Uh, second is um, the re-intervention rate is low. Uh, so at this point, uh, I think you've got two good options. Uh, based and you can make the decision based on other factors such as patient comorbidities, anatomical issues at the at the root, et cetera. But it should also be, you know, uh, emphasized that this is applicable only to the population that was studied, which does not include uh, younger patients, very few under seventy, virtually nobody under sixty-five, and no bicuspid valves. Um, you know, thirdly. Um, I think that we're seeing increasing, um, you know, uh, uh, valve and valve uh, use both in, in uh, original surgical valves and original TABR valves. And it's going to be important that we now examine that population carefully to learn. I think we're, I think we cannot assume by any means that the second valve is going to last longer than the first valve. So uh, scrutinizing that, the outcomes in those populations is going to be critical to, to help determining uh, uh, lifetime management. Yeah, certainly we're going to keep, um, you know, considering this. And it is interesting that we're going to soon have the, hopefully the self-expanding platforms as well, presenting their data in another year or so. Um, you did look at some several subgroups, you know, by ejection fraction, for example, and, and um, women and quality of life metrics. Um, and we, we did see very similar results. I, were there any differences at seven years in the different subgroups? No, there, there was no advantage or disadvantage to either treatment in, in any um, analyzed subgroups. And of course, we'd have to reiterate to 
you know, viewers that the low risk trial meant and it addressed really patients who had suitable anatomy. So patients who had transfemoral approach, primarily, you know, trileaflet valves, not by not by cuspid valves and so on. Um, do you think patients with concomitant coronary artery disease, was that a subgroup that was evaluated in the trial or is this something that we need to look at separately? So uh, you bring up a very interesting point there um, in that about uh, uh, 25 uh, to 27% of patients uh, in the trial had concomitant coronary artery disease. Um, uh, most of those patients that were randomized to surgery uh, underwent cabbage. Um, and very few of the patients in the TAVR arm underwent PCI. Uh, we are seeing between five and seven years an increase in myocardial infarction in the TAVR arm uh, compared to the surgery arm. And and we haven't gone into this in, in huge depth to begin with. We're analyzing all those results, but part of the uh, um, speculation or, or hypothesis is that there may be a benefit to surgery from the early revascularization. Uh, it didn't, it, there was no disadvantage to having surgery early on, uh, but we didn't see any advantage. Well, it, it's possible that now we're beginning to see an advantage of the concomitant initial uh, coronary revascularization with surgery. Um, because there is an increase in both MIs uh, and uh, coronary reintervention at seven years in the TAVR arm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this was certainly a very important discussion to have um, and a deep dive, actually, into the um, partner three seven-year outcomes. Um, thank you very much for being with us. And just my final question, is this going to be simultaneously published or are we expecting it further down the line? Uh, no, it will be simultaneously published in the New England Journal. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mervat. Certainly appreciate you asking me to do this.